All right, let's get right into this. Precious Heavenly Father, we need your help as we approach your promises, your word. It's exciting, but Lord, we need the help of your precious Holy Spirit on assignment by Jesus to unfold the word of God for it, to breathe it into our hearts and our souls so that our lives will never be the same again. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Today, I have my special little guest with me, Pam, my beautiful wife. We're talking about you need joy. Isn't that good, Pam? Oh, yeah, it's one of my favorite subjects. God's message for joy in our hearts is so encouraging. And today, especially in this segment, I want to zone in on in love and full of joy. You like this subject. Very, very much. It's transformed my life. That's exactly. Oh. And is transforming it my life. It is. Yeah. It is. It's constantly, joy is energizing us to live for Jesus. Part one, we talked about trading sorrows for joy. So important. If, you, if you're still dealing with grief, you need to listen to part one again and again. And get that medicine in your heart and soul. Part two, we talked about joy. The joy of the Lord is the strength for life. God's delight in you, igniting joy for your life. And now today in this segment, part three, in love and full of joy because love is essential to joy, isn't it? Very, very much so. Pam, we're going to get pragmatic with joy, how to get in and how to take it in. Two different parts. Why love is essential to this process of getting joy on the inside of us. A spiritual biblical principle is this. You can have love without joy, but you cannot have true joy without love. Let me explain that. You can have water without swimming, but you cannot swim without water. We need to understand that love is essential to joy. Joy is the fruit issuing from love, Pam. That's right. In 1 John 4, 8, it says God is love. It doesn't say that God is joy. No. It says God is love. Right. Right? In John 3, 16, it says God so loved that he gave. God didn't sow joy that he gave. God so loved that he gave. So God didn't so rejoice that he gave. He so loved. There's a great distinction there. That's right. In 1 Corinthians 12, 31 says, earnestly desire the greatest gifts, still more excellent. The highest of them all is love. Not joy, but love. Right? Now, we're not demoting or downgrading joy. No, no, no. We want to restore God's order for you, for your thinking about what love is, so you better understand what joy is for. You got to know what love is for, so you better understand what joy is for. Love is the context that serves joy and makes joy work but you have to work it. You got to be able to plug it in. That's right. Because Nehemiah 8.10 says, don't sorrow. It doesn't mean you don't feel grief, but don't sorrow. Don't stay in your sorrow. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Pam, that's like saying the joy of love is our strength. But again, you must put joy to work. You can have love without joy, but you cannot have joy without love. Think of it like this. You can have the tree without the apple, but you cannot have the apple without the tree. See, I know parents who truly love, but they feel like they're failing. I know wives, husbands who truly love, but they really feel like they're failing. Let's do a spiritual checkup right now. You see, if love is your heart muscle, then think of joy as the blood supply, getting all that energy to every cell in your being. See, you're not failing at love. You're anemic. There's no joy flowing. In love, you are alive, but you live life strong. You know, I like to say that you live life strong. You live life with purpose when you're joyful. If love is the why, the motive, joy is the how. 1 Corinthians 13 says, love never fails. That's right. And here, here's some examples of being in, but not taking in. Okay, you can I got to hear this. So you can be in, but not take okay. in. Okay. So you can go to Burger King and sit there and smell the food, but never eat it, never take it in. And that you, doesn't make any sense. 
Well, no. Well, maybe <laughs> maybe Burger King, but <laughs> not Five Guys. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you can go to the best doctors in the world and refuse the medicine that'll save your life. Uh, people went to see Jesus and they stayed in his presence, but they never, some of them didn't take Jesus in like Judas like he he was around Jesus all the time, saw the miracles. Presence, but he didn't take in the life. Did he? he didn't take him in, Judas did. You see, like gas needs a tank to hold it and direct it to the engine, joy requires context, a tank. All of life, my friend, requires context. Joy requires context and love is that context. Joy overcomes adversity, grief, pain, sorrow, mourning, stress, sign, but it must, it must have context. Love is the engine and the spark that puts the fuel of joy to work. That's right. You know, in the book of Acts, it talks about Paul and Silas and they got thrown in jail and they were beaten and all they were doing was just doing missionary work, bringing good, good news to people. But instead of complaining and lamenting, the Bible says that these two missionaries, they began to pray and sing songs of praises to God. And you know what happened perfectly well, if you know the story, that the word of God says, God inhabits the praises of his people. That's they right. knew that. And so they did that. And you know, Jesus said, wherever two or three people are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So something's gonna happen here. That's right. And in the presence of the Lord, there's joy. Praise God. Joy is powerful. It is. Joy has power. You want to be powerful? Get inside of love and be full of joy. Joy is powerful. Acts 16 said that then suddenly there was this mighty earthquake and all the cells, just all the the the, the bars just fell down. It they all broke. It wasn't a destructive earthquake. No, no. And all the chains on them just came loose. And the warden got so scared, he was about to kill himself. And Paul and Silas yelled out, don't, don't kill yourself, don't hurt yourself. We're still here, there's no problem. So that jailer, because of their faithfulness, to stay in love and be full of joy. Took him home, nursed him, took care of him. And you know, that jailer gave his life to Jesus. Praise God. And why? Why did he do that? What happened? It was a revival broke out, right? Because Paul and Silas never dared step out of the context of God's love so they could work efficiently God's joy. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. It was their strength. I mean, it shook the prison. Even in the darkest dungeons, you can be in love and full of joy, the power, the strength of the Lord. All of life, my friend, requires context. So this next story, this really, for me, helps drive home the the idea, the concept, the picture of context, how, why it's so important. Joshua Bell, one of the most famous violinists in the world. Several years ago now, he was in a, it was in a Washington newspaper and they did a very interesting story on Joshua when he came to town. He was to be in town for the weekend and doing these concerts and played to completely sold out crowds. You couldn't even get a ticket anywhere legally and scalp tickets were going for thousands and thousands of dollars. The reviews were amazing, praising his abilities as a modern virtuoso in the classical world. Basically, the guy's pretty doggone good. One of the reporters interviewing him asked him about his journey to fame and fortune. And specifically, the reporter asked, like, did you ever play as a street musician to pay your bills? Well, the answer was no. Then the reporter asked an unusual question. He said, how do you think people on the street or in a train station would like your playing? I mean, if you were disguised as a street musician, what do you think their reaction would be? Well, Joshua, he found it such a curious question that the journalists had, they came up with a plan and together for Joshua to leave his hotel Monday morning after all of his sold out concerts, dressed in a disguise as a street musician and armed only with his $3.5 million Stradivarius violin. That's right, that's how much that instrument costs. Joshua felt like the test would only, it would be the most true if it was only, the only variable would be the venue. So there he stood in the subway station with reporters hidden all around him, waiting to follow people out into the street and collect their reactions firsthand. He began with the most difficult, critically acclaimed piece he played in his show. Now listen, in a posh downtown theater with velvet curtains and formal dress, this musical masterpiece would have his audience so spellbound 
that the critics would afterward claim the audience forgot to breathe. That's, That's how amazing this piece is. It's just genius. But here in the subway station, the reaction wasn't even close. People were so obviously irritated with him. His $3.5 million Stradivarius was provoking angry glares, grumbling, head shaking, people walking by, shaking their head, and even a few rude comments. What are you doing, you know? One by one, as reporters chased down obvious reactions, they heard things like, doesn't that clown know that playing in the station's illegal? One lady said, we need cops to arrest these vagrants so that they don't do this anymore. Another angry traveler said, you know what? I threw a buck or two in his case, hoping he'd just shut up and go away. The interesting thing was this. As the reporters dug for more information, some of the people that were so frustrated with him as a street musician actually tried to get tickets to the Joshua Bell concert and couldn't get them because it was sold out. Wow. I mean, no kidding. They couldn't stand Joshua as the street musician playing his $3.5 million Stradivarius, mm -hmm. but they would have paid hundreds upon hundreds of dollars, possibly even thousands, to go to the same guy's concert. And when they found out that it was him, most of the people wanted to run back in here and play, but it was too late. They had failed to discern the prize, Pam, mm -hmm. because there was no proper context. Yeah. You see, context in this conversation, it's not just something, it's everything. How could something that is so celebrated be at the same time utterly rejected? I mean, despised. The enemy, see, he wants that for you. Your amazing design out of context, out of order. So you feel rejected. No context. It's like eating your peanut butter and jelly sandwich without bread, Pam. <laughs> and, and the weird thing is, I know that you've actually done that. I've actually done it. <laughs> Love is the address, the theater the house, the home. Joy is the banquet. If love were to be the concert hall, the stage and setting. Joy is every note of the concert and without context, the concert goes unheard, rejected and despised. That's good, Pam. Listen, you must be in love to get the fill of joy. Let's take back a few terms just so that we understand this conversation because sometimes the meaning can be lost in the terms. First of all, what's love? If we have to be in love, and we've heard people talk about being in love, if we have to be in love, then we better know what it is. Yeah, that's right. First John 4, 8 says, God is love. We know that. We said that before. But 2 John 1, 6 says, And this is love, that we walk in accordance with His commandments and we're guided continually by His ways and precepts. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should always walk in love. And Pam, love is God's commandment, His state of being for life. You walk in it. You live in it. So think of it like this. Love is the ultimate context for your life to thrive in. Love is the address for you to live. Like a fish needs water to live and move, you and I need God's love to live and move. That's called context. Of course, that makes no sense if you buy into this culture's fake version of love, right? Entertainment's version of love, or even Hallmark's version of love. Definitely not religions or the new breed of political correctness. The world sells us on a selfish version of love that's all about taking. Give me, feed me, affirm me, tell me nice things. Would you just validate my feelings for a moment here? You give to me. That's what I think love is. And yet we know the Bible says God, who is love, so loved that he gave. It's like saying love so loved that he gave. Forgiveness is a true great expression of love. You must forgive to be in love just like you must come through the door to be in the theater. Jesus is the way and his way is forgiveness. That's right. And true love gives. And by this, we recognize the true context for life. You know, God's love, it's where we can finally come into the house of love. Oh, yes. And live. And we live life strong in the house 
of love. I love that. Yeah. I wrote a song. It's, it's coming. Wait, wait for it. <laughs> John 15, 7 says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you will and it will be done for you. Oh my goodness. That's so beautiful. Oh, everyone look at that big honking if. Jesus said, if you're in the right context, the right place, if you're in God's love, his love, then you get all the promises inside of that house of love. You see, right context sets you up for right outcomes. Right seeds need the right ground. Look, we all know that. You don't have to be agriculturally minded to understand right seeds need the right ground. Context is the reason Washington state apple trees don't grow in the Arizona desert. Context is the reason flowering cactus don't grow in Michigan. You, my friend, need the right ground to grow in and love is your appointed context for a life. You obtain when you remain. That's what Jesus said. Or you obtain if, if you remain. Oh, that's good. That's pretty catchy there. Yeah, you like that, huh? <laughs> In your context, you're the right person. Out of context, you will always be wrong and struggling. You know, context is not just about placement, but it's about timing. Yeah. If you walk through the doors of a bank first thing in the morning when it opens, you're a celebrated customer. I like that. But if you walk through the doors at two in the morning, you're a thief. <laughs> right. <laughs> Context is all about the right time and the right place. That's right. That's good, Pam. What does God say about your place and your timing? He says this, you obtain when you remain. That's John 15, verse seven. You obtain when you remain. There is never a right time to step out of love, to be in unforgiveness, to be in bitterness, to be in selfishness. The context of your design is meant to be love. You must live inside the house of love and be filled with joy. Anytime anyone or anything other than love becomes your source, your source of context, you're out of context. So, We've talked a little about the real meaning of love. Let's remind ourselves again what real joy is, what it really is. Joy, we've already learned, is the antidote for grief, sorrow, sadness, sighing. Joy is both a motivator and the reward. Hebrews says that Jesus himself, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. Nehemiah 8 verse 10 says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. See, this is what joy is. The Bible calls joy an oil, an anointing oil that doesn't just get on us, but it gets in us. It must get in you. It must fill you. Joy fills us to the full and running over. It's medicine. It's empowerment. It's strength. It's truly filling. It's empowerment. Jesus told his sad disciples, he said, it's profitable for you that I go because I'll send the comforter and he will live where? In you and he will fill you. You can't live a profitable life without the full package of Jesus, what he came to give us. And the news flash is this. It's not just God's love. Yes, you must abide in God's love. That's what we're calling the house of love. But, but you were meant to live full of joy inside the house of love. That's where the banquet is, my friends. God's joy is empowering, supercharging. It's terrifying to the devil. Pam, God's joy is terrifying to the devil. Joy is a spiritual nuclear reactor that makes your design unstoppable, but it must get in you and not just on you. That was Jesus' order for each one of us, in you and to the full. So let's have Jesus now himself explain this whole in love and full of joy combination. Pam. Okay, John 15, seven through 11. It says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you. Is Jesus talking. And whatever you wish, and I will do it for you. Oh. My father is glorified and honored by this. I believe that, God's honored when you receive this. That's right. And when you, he's honored and glorified when you bear much fruit and prove yourselves to be my true disciples. 
I have loved you just as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love and do not doubt my love for you. If you keep my commandments and obey my teaching, you will remain in my love. And just as I have kept my Father's commandments, I remain in his So love. Jesus is saying he practices this context right. of love. He said, I only do what the Father says to do. And that's what he says. I have told you these things so that my joy and my delight may be in you. So God's going to smile when you do this and, and that your joy may be full and complete and overflowing. Oh, my goodness. And think about it. Jesus said, I told you these things. What things did he tell us? He said, he told us if, he said, if, if we abide in him means if we reside in him in love, then his joy and delight may be in us, in us and in you and that your joy may be complete and running over. When you get the right address, when we get the right address for life and love, then we get the energy for life, which is joy. Oh, I, I got to tell you, this has revolutionized and is, I said, but revolutionizing my life. When we go inside love and we live there, God's joy will then pour on us, in us, and through us to other people. And then and only then will we be able to love others as Jesus loved us. Pam, that is Jesus' order for true life and living. See, when I say order, I'm just talking simple like one, two, three. Like one comes before two, comes before three. Here we see it, friends. We live in love and full of joy. The blessing deliveries come to your address. Do you ever order from Amazon and pick up your package at some strange building across town? No. No, no, you don't do that. Maybe some religious looking place? No, no. Your orders come to your house. Why don't you think God can do as good or better than Amazon or UPS? It's so easy to get tricked by the enemy out of Jesus' order for context. Say this out loud. Context. Say it. Context. We get tricked into a false pursuit of living in a state of joy, hoping to feast on love. Once we get to that happy place, that's why people are so event oriented, so experience oriented. We chase a residence called our happy place. But the truth is we are to live inside the house of love. That's the place by faith residing at the address of love. Once inside love, you get filled with joy. You take in the banquet of joy, unspeakable, full of glory, but it's inside the house of love. The enemy desperately wants you thinking upside down about this, so you reverse that order. So you live in fear with no joy. Yeah, and God does not want that. Psalm 16, 11 says, in your presence, Lord, is fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So again, let's say it this way. In the presence of love is fullness of joy. So quit chasing joy or happiness or experiences so that you feel loved. You're reversing God's order. You're, you're putting two before one. God is love and in love's presence is joy. That's the source of strength for life. You are meant to be full of joy and glory. Living where? At the address called love. If you feel like you're failing at love, it's probably because you're trying to eat it instead of walking in it, living in it, residing in love. The enemy works to confuse that order. It's just simply putting two before one. You're trying to consume love so that one day you can live in a state of happy. It's an exercise in futility. Spiritually speaking, my friend, that's like trying to eat your house so that you can live in your soup. It's that upside down. Come on. Even the big bad wolf knew that the bacon was in the house, <laughs> not the house. Right, Pam? Bring out My, the bacon. Yes, exactly. My friend, wolves cannot break down the true house of love, but they do out wait outside for those getting tricked out of the house. Maybe you've been blaming yourself for not being strong enough to love your family. Maybe you're blaming love for being the cause of all your sadness, sorrow, and grief. 
People talk about break, breaking their heart and it's all because of broken love. Have you lost your marriage and you think that there just wasn't enough love? Do you cry over wayward children? Maybe it's wayward parents or a parent's rejection. And you think it's not, there wasn't enough love? Do you feel like the lack of loving support stole your dreams? Maybe broke your heart? Many people secretly blame love for life being hard. Well, that's an oxymoron. Life is life. First of all, love is not the antidote to sorrow, sadness, weakness, brokenness. It's joy. The force of God's joy is your strength, not love. His everlasting joy empowers your life for success. And love is the context that you walk in, you run in, you even fly in. Pam, if you want to go across the Atlantic Ocean, why would you try to swim it? Get inside a 747, That's right? Safe. Don't try to go through life outside of love. Get inside of Air Jesus 747 and be filled in the plane, in the jet of life. Be filled. Joy is fuel that ignites and lights your life. Jesus tells a parable of 10 virgins in Matthew 25. He said, it's all about five wise virgins that get what the other five foolish virgins don't get. Now, this is important. All 10 of the virgins are considered children of God's covenant. That means they all lived at the house of love. They all lived there. The distinction between the two groups is this. Five get oil and five are empty of oil. No oil. All live at the same address, but five are considered foolish and only five are considered wise. Why? The five are foolish because they didn't get the full. Love is your design. Love is your house. You must live in love. But joy is the oil of your full. You must be filled with joy. I'm saying it over and over again because you've got to get this. If you're not full today, you're in the perfect place, God's presence. Now, don't let your condemnation raise its ugly voice. Don't let accusation from the past interfere with what God's love is speaking in your heart right now. The Lord is speaking to you and convincing you of this. Taste and see that the Lord is good. That's right. God is asking you to trust him with your emptiness, your weakness, and in its place, receive his full, his joy. Let his Holy Spirit fill you to the full with great joy. My friend, you need joy. You can live full starting right now. A person cannot exceed the programming of their heart. That's just a law of life. Did you know that even Jesus can't give you his joy if you refuse to step into his love, his provision, his finished work of grace at the cross. It's your choice. You've got to step in. We have to believe to receive. We have to believe to receive. You know, Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. That's how we do this. Mm -hmm. We just keep refilling up with his joy. Rejoying. Yeah, exactly. Rejoy. Re-enjoy his presence and get that joy flowing. I believe you're getting a deeper revelation of why Joy is so essential and important to your life. The bottom line is, joy is in love, activated by your faith. Joy is on the inside of love, activated by your faith, and it makes your design work. Faith triggers joy. It activates joy. This is how you do it. Right now, love is saying to you, come to me. That's Jesus. You can hear his voice. Come to me, and I'll give you, I'll fill you. We can activate the power, the finished work of the cross in every area of our lives today. All that God has willed for you by the victory of the cross right now, we can appropriate. We can take possession of it now. Faith is now. The victory of the cross is right now. Bring your life, every hurt, your emptiness, all of your spiritual anemia to the cross of Jesus Christ for mercy, healing, forgiveness, and for a full tank of joy, because you 
need joy. I want to pray a special prayer for you right now. All of you who feel empty, you feel weak, you just feel bankrupt of any kind of joy. Let me pray this for you. Jesus, you said for us to come to you and that you would give us rest. You would give us your precious Holy Spirit who fills us, comforts us, and empowers us. Lord, I'm asking you right now to help my friend. Lift them out of this state of confusion, hurt, and of the hopelessness. Imprint your word of life on the inside of them and stir up their understanding to realize they live inside your love. They abide in your love, Jesus. Not just because they deserve it. No, we don't, and none of us deserve it, but Lord, all because of your amazing grace. Now, they get to enjoy your benefits, your blessings, Jesus. We appropriate every good thing that you have paid for on the cross. This honors Father God. And in your name, Jesus, we pray it, we believe it, and we receive it. Amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's Word is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen. He sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. Remember, Jesus is Lord, and in Him, we can live life strong.